Hey, this is Pastor Ron, and I would like to just give you a little bit of information on one of the outreaches that we have here at Alpha Lions Den Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. We actually have a food ministry that is called His Food Ministry. As a matter of fact, I want to welcome you to go check that out on our website. You can go to hisfoodministry.net. And what we do is we supply food to people in our community every single Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. That is three days a week that we're supplying food to the people in this community. I would love to take this opportunity to ask you to partner with us. Now, it's very simple to do. You just go to our website, and on that website, you just click on the donation button. And only for $25 a week, you can sponsor a family of four. And we will feed that family for all three of those days. So for $25, we will feed a family of four on Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. They will get a banana box of nutritional, good quality food. Obviously, if you want to sponsor a family for a month, many of you want to do that. You can just donate $100. But I just wanted to let you know that's one of the outreaches of our ministry. We've been doing it for 15 years and we really need your help to continue at the pace we are running. So thank you for, for listening to me, and let's get back to the message. After Monday, you can't say Tuesday is a part of Monday. It just don't work that way. It's one day or the other. Unless when God gave this to us, that there was that period of twilight between the two evenings. There was a window. And the more I thought about this, it's because of the way Jehovah honored his word. If he said, listen, if you do not obey this, and that day began a Sabbath day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a Sabbath day. So if they did not have this window and there was that line that was just drawn in the sand, and Joseph of Arimathea had to get think about this. Jesus gave up the ghost. He was, he was sacrificed. He was crucified from the third hour, which would be nine in the morning, until the ninth hour, which would be three in the afternoon. We know there was entire darkness over the entire earth from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And that is when he yelled out at 3 o'clock. This is how precise he is. Listen, he is into the details. God himself, Jehovah, and Jesus, his son, Yeshua, they are into the details. He's just not winging it. Like, oh, okay, we'll just, we'll do it on this day. We'll do it on that day. No, that's the traditions of men. So as I watch people today do and say some of the things they do, I think, do they really even know the Messiah? Or is it just a vain religious belief? I go back always to Nicodemus in John 3.3. 3. That's a basic chapter, basic belief. But he was one of the most religious men on the face of the earth. And Jesus told that man, you must be born again. He said, that which is born of flesh is only flesh. Think about that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the groups. So we need to be concerned with our friends and family in what position do they lie in. I think of people that used to come to this church now that don't come here any longer and I see them out and about and, well, are you going to church anywhere? No, we just... We just kind of, well, I know what you preach. You're supposed to be a church, but we don't want to be a church. They've not been taught anything more than a hope to think, okay, at one time, 15 years ago, I came to the altar and said a prayer, so that locks me into heaven. We need to understand and we need to make sure that people have been born again and their minds have been renewed. That we not be conformed to the world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why? So that we may prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God on this earth. That's why we're here. 
So when I drive by now and I see people picking up their Easter baskets and scraping up their Easter eggs and tearing down their signs, I'm like, look, it's not over. It's not over. This is a wonderful window. It's a wonderful opportunity for you that know the Messiah and that know the things of the kingdom of God. This is it. This, this is one of the highest seasons of the year, if not the high season, the highest holy days. So it's not just after that Sunday it was over. Leviticus 23.1 And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim. We know this. That means preach, teach, and instruct. To be my holy convocations, holy dress rehearsals. These are my feasts, he said. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord. They are holy convocations which you shall proclaim when? At their appointed times. So there is exactly appointed times by God that we are to honor Him. So listen, if, if the Passover is all about Jesus, and it was Jesus' mission from when he was born. He said, this is the thing that God has given me, he told Pilate. I have the strength, I have the power to lay my life down and to bring it and to take it back up again. He was destined to fulfill the Passover. Most people today don't even talk about the Passover. You never even hear them mention the Passover. And I did it this year on purpose. When someone said to me, Happy Easter, I said, well, I celebrate the Passover. And they looked at me like I would come from Mars. I thought, well, okay, what is Easter? Well, first of all, they don't know what Easter is, but I know what Easter is. They think it's about the resurrection. Well, listen. The Passover is not about the resurrection. Do you understand that? The Passover is not about the resurrection. The Passover is a distinctly set apart day in the history of the entire world that God said I would send my son to the earth to die for the sins of mankind. And through that feast, it opens up the window for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Messiah had to come and fulfill Passover. Because of the Roman church, they set up that, and it, it's there, they'll tell you, in their writings, they'll tell you they brought paganism into the church to do away with the ways of God, with the feasts of God. They will tell you that. The church, my friend, that was in darkness for 1,500 years, and thank God for Martin Luther, when he come out and the Protestant Reformation was birthed, Ever since then, God has given a man or a woman on the earth a word. And when they speak that word, it births that word into the earth. And then other men and women grab that word, and they grab that word, and they grab that word. And the speaking of that word is what brings it to life on the earth. The Passover had nothing to do with Easter or the resurrection. But yet millions of people would be celebrating just Easter, which is never even mentioned in your Bible. Do you not think if it was important, it would be mentioned somewhere in your Bible, one time in the King James Version, and bless the people who love their King James Version, I'm fine with that. But there was one time there he made a mistake. Because when they were sitting there doing their translations, could you imagine? They never even, they're sitting there thinking, uh, what, are, what word are we going to use? It was Pasach. 
Pesach, and they translated that to mean Easter. Because for 1,500 years before then, they knew the Council of Nicaea. They knew the traditions that had been decided upon. So one time they put in their Easter. One time, and now the new King James is taking that out. Most of all the other Bibles have taken it out. I think it's in um, Acts 12, 1. But they're retracting that because they know that was put in there in error. So from what God said, he said, you shall proclaim at their appointed times. These are divinely appointed times by God. So on the 14th day of the first month, at when? Twilight. I've listened to hundreds of guys give their spiel on YouTube. Thousands of guys. And I'm serious. And I have hardly heard anybody even mention the twilight. And when they do, they just read over it. But when I heard that that twilight period was the period between two evenings celebrated by the Pharisees, I thought, wait a second. That is a window at the end of the 14th day. It is a window there that it would give the Messiah, if you looked at every single day as a 24-hour period, that in that full three-day cycle, you would have exactly 72 hours almost to the minute. 24, 48, 72. Is that correct? Yeah. So you would have exactly three days of 24 hours to the exact minute. Because, listen, the clock did not start ticking when Jesus gave up the ghost. God's clock did not start ticking at the ninth hour of the day when he said it is finished. The, the Bible goes on and it says, well, wait a second. Joseph of Arimathea had to come to Pilate. And he said, listen, I need to get the body of Jesus and get it in a, in a freshly hewn tomb. So we know he was a wealthy man. It was a, it was a pure tomb. It was where no one else had been laid. So he had, from 3 o'clock after that, they had to make sure that the, that the prisoners were dead. They had to take them down off of the crosses. In that period, somewhere in that period, Joseph of Arimathea had to run and tell Pilate, hey, I want the body of Jesus. We know Pilate told the soldiers, hey, I want you to go make sure that Jesus is dead. So, that, I mean, the Romans knew how to check if you were dead or not. God's clock never even started yet. I believe it got so far into that period, we have to, we have to agree on this. It had to be after 6 o'clock. Because after that period was the Sabbath, and I guarantee you Joseph wasn't out running around getting um, jelly beans. Joseph, when it got to that period of the Sabbath, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is declared Sabbath, you're to be doing no work on there. If not, you're to be put to death. That man was back in his house. I promise you, Jesus was already in the tomb. So he knew about the period of the twilight. To me, it's the grace period. So he said, listen, you don't have to go put mom to death and dad to death and your son to death and your children to death and your aunts and uncles to death because they're not celebrating the Passover. It's like us now. It's a grace period. We're in grace. But let's watch how precise God is. So on the 14th day of the first month at twilight, the Lord's Passover, this is the Lord's Passover at twilight, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So for seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Verse 7. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. 
You shall do no customary work on it. Period. But you shall offer, make, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall also be a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it also. So these are the two, the two Sabbaths right there that we find that still they were to honor coming out of the Passover. So when you're looking at when the clock was to start, God's clock could have only started when the Messiah was placed in the tomb and the stone was rolled in front of that tomb. That would have been Joseph, signed, sealed, and delivered. Only thing he had to do was to be get to his house before the Sabbath started. Now, so we have Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then we have what? Feast of First Fruits. Now, according to, I gotta put something in. According to, watch this. Now put something in your Bible if you're going with me because I'm gonna come back there. You need to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, the, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians in, uh, 5 that Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our Passover. So everything that we preach and teach is about Jesus. Without Jesus, we'd never see and know what the feasts are all about anyway. First Corinthians 15, 12. Now listen. Now Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead. Now this is after the Passover. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And our faith is also in vain. Yes, and we would also be found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised Christ up whom he did not raise up. And if, in fact, if, he, if the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most to be pity. Listen. He's now, never still talking about the Passover and it being the resurrection of the Messiah. Because the Passover had nothing to do with the resurrection of the Messiah. It was when the Lamb of God had to be sacrificed and crucified on that exact day, the 14th day of the first month. This is the Lord's Passover. After that day, which we know is was from Tuesday evening, he was betrayed, but that's when the Passover started that Tuesday evening, and it ran till that Wednesday evening. So he was betrayed Tuesday night. They gave him the pilot at nine in the morning. He was examined, then the crucifixion started. The twelfth hour, when he was hanging on the cross, darkness over the entire earth. Three in the afternoon, he gave up the ghost. We get to that window of twilight. This is all the Passover. Right there at the period of the twilight, when that was all sealed up, and it, and it actually began the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that would have been specifically right after that period of twilight. So watch what happens. He says... Verse 20. Now Christ has risen from the dead and has become what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, wait a second. We know there is a feast of first fruits. Now, if you don't believe in the feast, you have no way of putting this together because you don't understand what the New Testament is teaching. 
The feast of the first fruits can only happen at a specific time. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by Adam came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own what? Order. God is into the details. There is a holy convocation. There is a appointed time. Christ, the first fruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Well, there's an order there, isn't there? Christ rose from the dead, correct? Then it tells us when the resurrection, the first resurrection of the dead is going to be. It says Christ is the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ, when? It is coming. The church has not been taught it's going to happen in his coming. They say something's going to happen before his coming. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom up to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So we're talking about the Feast of First Fruits. Now, let me, let me just tell you this, because I'm going to get into this deep on Sunday. When that period came, and the, that day started at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that first day started. When you go back to Leviticus 23, what's this? Leviticus 23. When you come into the land which I have given you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to who? To the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. Listen. On the day, on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So the feast of the first fruits is when? It's the day after the Sabbath. Now, when the Messiah had risen from the dead, we know that it was, I say, during that period of that twilight period. But we know the next day before that on the day of the 18th of April, that morning was the first day of the week. We know this as the Sabbath, as the, the day after the Sabbath is the first day of the week, our Sunday, if you're thinking Sunday. And the Bible tells us, listen, before the sunrise, so there's no sunrise, there's no resurrection, Easter morning, sunrise service, all that stuff. But anyway, the first day of the week, before the sunrise, Mary Magdalene, she was on her way to the tomb. Right? So she gets to the tomb, the angel's there, he said, why are you seeking a living among the dead? Jesus is not here. So we know that he was already out of there. And then, listen to this, she went to touch him. And what did the Messiah say? He said, do not touch me yet. Why? Because I have not yet ascended to Jehovah. I have not ascended yet to God. 
He had been raised from the dead, but he had not yet ascended to present himself as the first fruit. Because the first fruit offering must take place on the day after the Sabbath. Do you understand that? On the day after the Sabbath. So Jesus is the first fruit of many brethren according to 1 Corinthians 15. So when she came to him, she did not understand this. So she tried to touch him just out of excitement. He said, no, no, you can't contaminate me yet. Because they had to find a lamb approximately a little bit over one year age, older, a little bit over a year, like a year and a half old. He had to be without spot nor blemish. He had to be an absolutely perfect lamb. And he had to be offered as a sacrifice, a, a, a way during this period. And then they took this grain. They gave this grain when they came into their land. They took this grain and they brought it to the priest. And once they gave it to the priest, the priest took it to God the Father. Are you with me? So we know what Jesus represents for us. So Jesus is saying, wait a second. I have not yet presented myself to the Father. He said, you cannot touch me yet. Now we know later in that day, do you remember when he came to Thomas? He said they were in the upper room. They were waiting. They did just like he told Mary. Look, you go tell her brothers, go, go and wait for me. I'm, com I'm coming. So they go over to the upper room. They're all waiting there. They're afraid. Thomas says, listen, I'm not going to believe. Some of you guys saw him. I'm not going to believe until I see him. Until I put my finger into the hands of his hand and put my hand into his side. Into his side. Then the Messiah walks in the room later in the day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After he went to the Father and presented himself to fulfill the Feast of First Fruits. He walks into the room on the very same day and he says to Thomas, he picks Thomas out and he goes, Hey, listen, come over here, stick your finger in my hand and stick your hand into my side. Well, what was the difference? The difference was is Jesus knew that he had to fulfill the feasts at their divinely appointed times. So he knew what he had to do on the day of the Passover. He knew what he had to do for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He knew what he had to do for, to fulfill the Feast of First Fruits. And then we're also going to find out that he knew exactly what he was to do to fulfill the Feast of Pentecost. You just can't wrap it all up in one day and say, okay, we're going to talk about the resurrection and worship a bunch of Easter bunnies and eggs and jelly beans and spend $18.1 billion supporting it and say, nobody's worshiping it. Because when I saw it going about this and I said, well, what are they doing? He said, you know, you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. And I start thinking, well, okay, you say you don't, you don't honor that festival. I tell you, I honor a festival, it's Passover, and here's the way we're supposed to honor it and, and do this in remembrance of me. We're to honor this day in remembrance of the Messiah. They have a day over here they call Easter, which is a pagan god. They worship a pagan idol. They do the Easter egg hunt, which is a pagan festival. And, and just all these things just begin to mount up. The 40 days of Lent, we found, we taught what that is. So you got all these things coming up. Easter, the rabbit, the eggs, the Easter egg hunts, the coloring of the eggs. All, all these things are over here on this side of the scale. And then over here we have this way that God looks at it and he says, listen, it's, it's very simple, son. I have seven days. Just honor me on those. That's all. And I'm telling you, don't celebrate like the heathens celebrate. You're not supposed to imitate what they imitate. So that, that's a, a, an intro to just a piece of what we're going to get into Sunday. But I am telling you, there is a major, major key of revelation found in the Feast of First Fruits. 
Jesus had not yet presented himself to the Father as our feast of first fruits, like he said, he's the first fruit of many brethren. Jesus raised from the dead. He was the first fruit. There was people that died before him. Now there's been many brethren that have passed away after him. But he would not let Mary touch him because he said, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Amen? Amen. <coughs> All right, let's pray. Father, in the blessed name of your Son, we thank you once again for this word. Father, I thank you for the truth because you said that the truth that you know it is that truth that shall set you free. I understand this period of time that we're living in. I understand clearly the process of restoration, and I see clearly what you are doing in the church. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit would say to the church. Let us take these truths and be able to share it with our friends and family members. If nothing else, let us begin to plant the seeds. You told us one man plants the seed, another man waters, but only you give the increase. So, Father, we rely upon you. We depend upon you. And most of all, we trust you with our eternal souls. I ask that you would write this truth upon our hearts, that we would not sin against you. Amen.